Hello, ladies and gentlemen, everyone in between and beyond. My name is Taylor. Welcome to the review table. Now, this is a new semi-regular series that I want to try out where I look at not only what a game did, what it tried to do, but also how it plays, you know, just the typical review stuff. You know what a review is. This is kind of my take on it, so to speak. So, a little while ago, I played through all of the ill-fated Redfall with John, and I want to do a full review of the game in light of my experiences. With that in mind, I will go through the standard categories and do them a small piece at the end to say goodbye to Arcane Austin because of the tragic fate that they met at the hands of Microsoft and Xbox executives. Now, let's take a bite out of Redfall's setting story. Now, let's take a bite out of Redfall's story setting because believe it or not, it does have one and I am sad to say that it is th as thin as a blood vessel. So the game is set in a small fictional island in Massachusetts, uh, the town being called Redfall, before the events of the game, and is basically asking to be haunted by supernatural powers with a name like Redfall. Now, I mentioned the setting because it plays a major point uh, in the story regarding how and why the vampires are contained to this space, though I do have a couple issues with it. Because most of the characters have no hint of a Massachusetts accent. Because none of the characters have even a hint of a Massachusetts accent. Now, I understand they're all meant to be from various places and then come to the island, but it's still just kind of annoying. Even the NPCs who claim to have grown up there have no hint, no whiff of that accent. And I understand that they wanted a diverse cast of supporting characters from all sorts of backgrounds, which I fully support, but if these characters are meant to have lived on the island for any number of years, they would have some sort of accent related to the region. Like, it doesn't have to be a full Massachusetts kind of accent that I will not be replicating here, but a mix of the accent where they came from and the accent for where they're living. Not to mention, there are a lot of themes and ideas that the game could have played into using this setting that have never been explored, but we'll get into that more just, just a little later. So, the game begins with what is honestly the closest thing to a cutscene that it will ever show you, uh, where the vampires were created in a lab experiment gone wrong, and then they slowly started taking over the town. There isn't a lot here. The game doesn't explain too much about how no one noticed the increased disappearances, or that they were slowly but surely becoming livestock for some undead nightmare creatures. Before long, the vampires have become bolder and start to feast on people in the streets. This is where the player comes in, as they have been trying to flee the island, and then become trapped by a giant wall of water as it rises, stopping all marine traffic. Taking with it all of the water from around the island as well, creating just a small kind of anti-moat system. Though in addition to the water, which will stop any traffic in and out, the sun has also been eclipsed because of the power of the vampires. Now, I'm really trying to understand how this eclipse works for the island and whether or not it affects other parts of the world. This part of the story always confused me, because they didn't explain it from the context of the rest of the world and how they would have likely drawn a lot of attention. The central plot hole of air traffic and satellite imagery would have identified an issue with the island almost immediately if, unless the vampires had already run the world government, at which point, why do you care about this small island? So it just it's really confusing because the second you actually take a step back and you look at it, you're like, that narrative doesn't make sense. Nothing about this game is going to make sense. After the wall erupts, you select one of the four potential main characters, who are apparently all very adept at killing vampires. So the option I went with is Devinder, the cryptid hunter, who was on the island to promote his new book and to search for evidence of these vampires, which he classified as the most, you know, the closest thing to a real life cryptid he's ever going to find. Uh, as the vampires attack, he tries to leave and, of course, is kind of stuck on the boat with everyone else. He's much more crowd control focused with a shock shooting javelin, a teleportation device, and his ultimate, which is a giant kind of black light stake uh, that he can deploy anywhere, which is really nice. He is a mix of terrified and excited during the game because he's not only confirming his suspicions that the supernatural is real, but at the same time, that very phenomenon is trying to actively kill him and drink his blood. John picked the next character, Jacob, an ex-military sniper who serves as the resident edgelord, hood, black clothes, crow, and all. Uh, oh God. Jacob was a part of Bellwether, the private military organization that serves as some of the humanoid enemy forces, and he has a deep, dark reason for fighting against the vampires, 
as well as his former comrades, which we'll get into in a bit. There are, of course, never explained very well, at least I did have to do some digging and I did find it. Uh, but he does have some weird mystical raven powers, and Jacob seems annoyed about all that has happened, and of course, he wants to pay back the vampires for whatever happened to him to give him these supernatural powers. There are two other characters that you can play as, one with a cute robot dog who is part of the Coast Guard, so she's there to just, like, rescue people in general, and one with an undead vampire boyfriend who she can summon as a minion and a kind of shield of sorts. We did not pick these two characters, if you couldn't tell. Uh, in other words, they can split into the scientific and the mystic. Now, all of them were technically on the island for one reason or another, but realistically their backstories aren't that important beyond Jacobs and Devinders because those are the ones that we actually explored. After all this, you get back through the town to the local fire hall where a group of survivors is holding out and you agree to help them as they plan to take down the first vampire god, Dr. Addison, better known as the Hollow Man. We don't learn that he's a vampire god initially, purely we just think of him as a powerful vampire. Not the one who blacked out the sun in the intro, uh, we'll address her later. No, the Hollow Man was created in his own cult. These are the first areas where you're tasked with fighting off some cultists alongside vampires as you try to retake this portion of the town. Now, I will talk about the gameplay later, but it boils down to understanding the memories of the vampire that they have to kill and take something special to them so they can open the door with the little, into their little pocket dimension thing, which is also never explained. Um, and I've never really associated or seen vampires being associated with kind of the spatial magic or whatever is going on uh, that allows them to make their own kind of pocket dimension to hide out in. Anyway, uh, this special memento for the Hollow Man is a butterfly pendant. Now, I did not understand the story very much at the time because I really did not care and Redfall does a horrible job about keeping the player engaged during their quote story moments, which is just follow these it's outlines of like human blood circulatory systems. It's not even, it doesn't even look like people, man. Like it's, it's, oh, it's rough. Anyway, anyway, um, I had, so I had to do a lot of research for the sake of the video. Basically, Addison was a professor at a bio, of biochemistry, but suffered from a neurodivergent disease. So he began conducting human experiments at the university that then kicked him out when they discovered it. He wanted so badly to find a cure for his disease that he was willing to do, again, very illegal human experimentation. Though when he was fired, he turned to his daughter, who was around eight at the time, and began to draw her blood, because for some reason this helped stave off the disease. Now, I am not a biology major, I am not a chemistry major, I have never studied neuroscience or anything of the sort, so I cannot speak to the accuracy or validity of using a family member's blood to hold off an undescribed, unnamed, neurodivergent disease so i will not attempt to kind of dig into the science of that to me it sounds really dumb but that's just me i could be the dumb one here and he drew more blood as the years went on though to make it easier for her he attached a butterfly pendant to the needle to make it more appealing when she was 11 he drew too much blood in his greed and he effectively killed her from blood loss now this was all before he became a vampire which he then met some other uh, soon-to-be vampire gods that we'll get into later, and they gave him something to clear his guilt-clouded mind. He then agreed to join their company and began to experiment with the idea of creating vampires, and, you know, vampirism, for the sake of immortality. So then he became a vampire god by locking away his memories inside that very butterfly pendant. This is why you needed the item to access his space. It brings up the memories that he sacrificed along the journey. Using this, we free this part of the town and then fight the Hollow Man and, thankfully, end him. This means that a portion of the town is freed, and honestly, John and I believed this would be the end of the game, but we were proven very wrong when the rest of the game opened up after this. So I want to just kind of, before I move into the next part, I really want to stress that I do think the game would have been maybe not better in a lot of ways, but I think in terms of pacing, it would have been better to keep it in this one portion of the town, have the Hollow Man, and maybe another one of the vampire gods, you know, duking it out, and then you fight them both, and then you're done. This game carries on way too long, and this, to me, was a very logical stopping point. Hey, you've stopped the vampire that you think was trapping you here. 
And then, oh, no, there's even more vampires. It just felt very repetitive and derivative of the work they'd already done in establishing this first half. Anyway, we're going to move on from that. So after you defeat the Hollow Man, you go through a tunnel into the kind of next part of town where you're going to fight three separate vampire gods now. Yeah, they went from one to three, which just seems like a big jump to me. Whatever. Uh, the first two that you are introduced to are Miss Whisper and Bloody Tom, which I will focus on because uh, that's the side that John and I chose to tackle first, being Bloody Tom. Now, I want to mention that either could be tackled in whatever order, and there is functionally no difference between the different vampire gods outside of just a few mechanics in their boss fights uh, that aren't really worth mentioning here. So, following the standards set by the Hollow Man, Bloody Tom was had his own cultists, because of course he did, and again, a series of vampires, which he needed to fight to find his artifact with his memories attached. Dr. Thomas uh, Kildare, Kildare? I'm going to go with Kildare, uh, was a neuroscientist who had to step down from his position to take care of his ailing father, who had some sort of uh, terminal illness and was rapidly deteriorating. Tom was influenced by a psychiatrist, Alice Young, to leave his father behind and explore the new substance that his former employer was experimenting with, which was a prototype for their studies into immortality and what later led to their vampirism. The artifact that holds Tom's memory is the bell his father used when he needed something. It is clear that his father was bedridden and therefore needed an around-the-clock care, and Tom cracked under the pressure and was far too consumed by what he wanted out of life and how this was taking away from his goals, from his progress, to care for a man who wouldn't live past a few months. Now, moving into the third central boss of this game, Miss Whisper, aka Alice Young, yes, the psychiatrist mentioned earlier, ran a rehab clinic for uh, substance abusers. She also decided to experiment on her patients for some reason that isn't really clarified. Uh, this included a mysterious woman named Grace, who displayed some sort of powers which aren't really described. Now, she was naturally a substance user, which is why she ended up at the clinic, so she wanted to see Dr. Young, and then Dr. Young locked her in the basement where she kept experimenting on her alongside other patients. And somehow, someway, Grace's blood and whatever ability she had led the other vampires into discovering, okay, this is how we make vampires, and this is how we become immortal, this is how we become gods. It's never really explained what Grace's power is, or how, you know, she was able to turn people into vampires, if she herself was a vampire. I don't know, it's very open-ended. Uh, we also discover later on, though again, did not discover this during the playthrough, this was purely research, that Miss Whisper is the one responsible for giving Jacob his abilities, slaughtering his entire unit, and forcing him to hunt down vampires and his own former comrades. Now, why he has to hunt down his former comrades when it literally sounds like his entire unit was slaughtered and that he was infected by this, I don't know. It doesn't really explain it because the game's story is just so... It seems so threadbare, so disconnected from what it could be. Now, Miss Whisper's artifact is the key to the basement where she kept Grace and her other patients while she was experimenting on them. Grace will also play a vital role when we talk about the last boss of the game, but I want to go on a bit of a tangent first. Now, content warning, this will be discussing some rather heavy, potentially sensitive topics, so please, if you're not uh, interested in hearing about those, go to the timestamp in the description down below, uh, using the chapter system and just kind of navigate yourself there. If you're okay with more sensitive discussions, I think Redfall tackled some really serious issues, but in a really honestly terrible way that they could have done so much better at. So the Hollow Man is the issue of child abuse by a parental figure and the ways that they try to downplay or lessen it by associating with something innocent, such as a pendant or a stuffed animal. Now, abuse takes many forms, and most people are not talking, and most people aren't taking their relatives' blood for themselves. Still, it stands as an abuse nonetheless, because Addison was taking something away from his daughter that she had no control over. This kind of pressure that his daughter was under to make her father happy, and the manipulation her father would have had to have undertaken to get her to submit is insidious. Showing some of these or having a diary entry about how her daughter wants her dad to love her 
would shed light on the terrible power imbalance. Now, I'm not saying that this game needs to make a comment on these kinds of situations in the way that I am, but if you're going to include such a significant character beat, you need to treat it with respect and seriousness, because that's what it deserves. Child abuse of any form is a serious issue, and this is clearly meant to indicate that, hey, people all over the world are doing something to endanger their children, whether it be leaving them out in hot cars, taking substances while they're with their children, or numerous other things. People are putting their children at risk or using their power over their children to get what they want, even at the expense of their children's health. Tom walked away from his ailing father when he needed them the most and left him to die. Now this one should have depicted the massive amounts of stress Tom must have been under to make the decision between his father's life and walking away. The idea that he may have felt shackled for the foreseeable future and the fact that he couldn't hire a live-in nurse, presumably because of his father's attitude and rage, would have made Tom a more fleshed out, understanding character. Now I understand that Tom is seemingly portrayed as a selfish, kind of greedy individual, so walking away makes sense thematically, but seeing more of the struggle and questioning is essential. We should also see some of his father's perspective. Was he drowning in the guilt of no longer being able to live like he did before? Does he appreciate his son for caring for him? Or is he mad at the world for the state that he's in? Does he resent his son for clearly not loving and doting on his father who may feel like he deserves it? There are really complex familiar relationships that are trying to be expressed here that haven't been touched at all. They haven't been spoken about. They haven't been shown. And Redfall could do so much better if they had shown these, if they had expressed what their lives were like before so we could better understand them. So it would not only, again, flesh out these characters, but it would give context to Tom himself and his environment and why he made these decisions. It would help not necessarily humanize the characters because they're meant to be these soulless, you know, evil creatures and depicted as evil humans before they became vampires. But I feel like there is cartoony evil and then there's realistic evil. There is fleshed out. There is human evil that actually jumps off the page. I'm not asking for a whole, you know, I'm not asking for a Black Panther Marvel style villain arc where we sympathize with the villain's points. We understand where they're coming from and some people maybe even agree with them. What I'm asking for is if you're going to show complex, familiar relationships or relationships with people in power, abusing those without power, Take it seriously. Show us that abuse in a serious manner. Don't just be like, oh, he walked away and his dad died. Oh, he drained his daughter's blood and she died. Oh, she abused patients. Like you're just, you're saying words with no impact and that's almost irresponsible if you're going to tackle these kinds of topics. Speaking of, with Miss Whisper, it comes down to, again, that abuse of power when, some, when someone else is in your care. This is very similar to the other power dynamics that the other characters find themselves in, but again, a bit different because this is not family. This is strangers in a vulnerable position trying to better their lives, coming to you in the hopes that you will help them and you tearing apart that trust and using them for your own selfish gains. All of these characters were in a position of power over someone else that they were supposed to care for and decided that they would instead end their lives in some capacity rather than fill their intended duties. We should see more memories of the people that, you know, Dr. Young treated. Some of them improving slowly and others wallowing in the misery and comfort that they have found in the substances they abused. We should feel for the people that she has tortured and how she took away the opportunity that they had to recover and get better. They will never have that chance because now they're gone because of this selfish, vile, disgusting woman who then became a selfish, vile, disgusting creature. You don't have to make these villains sympathetic. What you have to do is help me understand exactly why I should hate them and to what level I should hate them and want them to disappear. Now, part of the reason I am so frustrated with this and how they handle these types of situations is that I have personal experiences with all of them in some form or fashion. I was abused when I was younger, not by a parent, but by someone I knew. And that desire to make someone else happy and that's even to go to self-detrimental lengths, is real. My grandfather was bedridden with an illness before his passing, and I remember everything that happened around that time. 
thankfully my family was still there for him until the end, but I can understand the pressure that Tom, if he were a realistic human being, if he was written as a realistic human being, would have been under. I also had a close friend who lost his life to substance abuse. So I have seen all three of these scenarios play out in some fashion, and I want there to be more weight placed on the seriousness of them in both the story and the character's reactions. Killing hordes of nameless grunts is one thing, but these are real life scenarios that people face and can cause a lot of trauma. As I mentioned, I have never played other arcane games, but I had expected better writing from them as they've been so heavily praised for their games in the past. Now, I assuming that was primarily on gameplay, but I feel like if they had experienced writers, they could have done better than this. This really frustrated me when I started to think about just what they were depicting and how lightly they were taking these topics. Now, the final boss, Black Sun, is a little different from the rest. Her name is Claire, and she and her twin brother, Charles, started a unique biotech company to attain immortality. That was their whole thing. Now, this wasn't their first intention, uh, as they did originally use it to make, quote, miracle cures to help heal the sick, and along the way, make a lot of money, but that somehow changed later on. They then discovered that Grace's blood was special and used it on, in experiments on themselves, thus allowing them to become vampire gods and create the hordes of monstrosities. And once they had consumed all of Grace's blood, they then turned into their final forms, that being of the Hollow Man, Bloody Tom, Miss Whisper, Black Sun, and Charles, who I haven't talked about yet, but he effectively became the next Grace. He became the next blood bag. For them to feed off of and to use as their sustenance to keep them going and then of course we fight and kill black sun uh in a pretty honestly anticlimactic boss fight who then you know uneclipses the sun and nothing really happens like the end of the story is just you killed black sun you saved grace who's somehow still alive uh and some of the vampires fled while well, most of them were killed, so it leaves it open for a sequel that I know will never come, and honestly, I'm okay with not getting one, because they handled this one so poorly, I would genuinely be concerned about future installments being handled even worse, in terms of the writing. Anyway, that's it for the villains, let's talk briefly about the good guys, not that they have uh, much to say. So, the good guys <laughs> almost have it worse, because they get such little time to actually become people and let you know who they are before you move on. Any actual development happens in the terrible still image cutscenes. Hell, we shot the husband of a pregnant woman, who was one of the first NPCs we met, because he had lost his nerve and tried to sacrifice her to the vampire gods, and we didn't realize we'd done it. We got an achievement for shooting Joe, and we're like, who's Joe? And then we later found Anna, his wife, giving birth, and we're like, hang on, where's her husband? And before John had to look it up and realize, oh yeah, we killed that guy because apparently he tried to sacrifice her. We hadn't even realized we had done that. And like the characters will spout a bit of dialogue at you, give you a little side mission where it's like, oh, kill this vampire, or go, you know, cleanse this church because it's related to their backstory. And like, just you don't care. You're not given a reason to care. These characters give, give one small side quest to help kind of introduce who they are and then you move on from them and you forget about them. Honestly, the story really boils down to the rich and powerful preying upon those beneath them and using them as food for their own hedonistic ways. Redfall could have been an exciting story with an actual comment about the modern world, but it was a blood deprived shell of its potential. Now the gameplay could have really saved this game, but it sadly did not. It is also just a husk of what it could have been. It's your basic first-person looter shooter with a few minor tweaks, such as the addition of stake launchers and UV guns because, of course, vampires. The guns have a colored rarity system, which affects the different modifiers they can have. Some even have stakes attached, so you can stake a vampire after you've shot it. This is important as the vampires have a unique mechanic uh, that requires you to stake them after you deplete their health bars. And the vampires themselves also come with a few different special powers, such as being able to impair your vision, call down lightning, and even drag you into the air to feast on your innards. And, of course, the characters get different special abilities, such as Devinder, who can make teleporters, throw shock javelins, and lay down massive UV-emitting stakes, 
that will petrify vampires from massive damage windows. Uh, Jacob can use his bird to scout and enter kind of a Soldier 76 auto-aim mode, where he's able to just, you know, headshot with a ghostly sniper rifle. And it's just, I don't know, it's so basic. I feel like they could have done so much more with it. Uh, of course, there are also modifiers such as Vampire Blood, which will give you different buffs and bonuses depending on what you have equipped, uh, which help, you know, create various different builds. However, they all feel way too shallow. Especially regarding the damage, you go down super fast. Like a couple bullets or a couple hits, you are down, regardless of your build, regardless of your character. And the characters can feel unique in their utility. When it comes to combat, which is 95% of what you're doing in this game, they all feel the same because they use the same guns, they get the same drops, and your abilities are off cooldown for, you know, good 10 to 20 seconds after you've used them, so most of the things are already dead because you used it the first time, or you've died because you couldn't use them. And the drops aren't even that interesting. John and I basically kept looking for higher level version of the firearms we'd already had from like almost the beginning of the game because we determined very early on that they were the best guns you could have. That was the assault rifle. And high rarity loot was also challenging to come across unless you triggered a Rook Storm, a special event that you unlock about halfway through the game. Um, after you unlock them, whenever you killed some vampires or alerted the cultists, this meter would go up until it was complete, and then a Rook would bring down lightning on you, and you would have to fight a little mini-boss, and then killing them always guaranteed a legendary, but most of the time it wasn't the one you wanted anyway. It could have been like a pistol, or even a flare gun. A legendary flare gun, because yeah, that's gonna do you some real good. And I hate to say it, that's the only thing that's kind of semi-unique about this game, outside of the vampires. All of the human enemies are basically the same, health bars and the deadliest bullets in the world. Honestly, you drop like a ton of bricks. Even their appearance doesn't change depending on their allegiances from the cultists to Bellwether. I would have loved to see, you know, Bloody Tom's cultists, Miss Whisper's cultists, and the Hollow Man's cultists all being kind of different visually speaking, but they're relatively the same and it's just really disappointing to see. And of course, they drop almost nothing interesting. So they're just filler. And none of this is helped by the quest design either, which... Yeah, Redfall is just downhill from here. All the quests boil down to hunting some human enemies, a few basic vampires, and then a named sub-boss, who is one of the vampire variants. Sometimes you have to retrieve an item for an NPC, but it's nothing revolutionary. You also unlock small safe houses to buy more supplies and take on small quests, which culminate in destroying an underboss, one of the stronger mini-bosses, then taking their skull and using it to open the door for the main bosses. These are unfortunately not optional. Honestly, the game had potential if they'd fleshed out the story more and explored the seriousness of the characters' actions, giving them more room to breathe and really explore who they were. They should have leaned harder into the vampire angle and given us more fantastic weapons specifically designed for them, because right now it feels like Call of Duty had a baby with Borderlands and Twilight. It's a generic mess that doesn't carve out its own place in the world. I would have loved a story where you focused on just, you know, half the map, the first half that you're given, but you explore Bloody Tom, you explore the influence he had, and maybe you introduce some of the other vampire gods. Sure, that's fine, because you can explore how they have started manipulating the town well before they became vampires, and how they used that power to then suppress anything, you know, that tried to stop them after they became vampires, or their goals. And you could really just dig in deep as to how entrenched certain communities get on small islands. You know, how secluded and xenophobic they become of outsiders to the point where they were following something they knew was wrong at its core, but they were still willing to do it because it was one of their own. With all that in mind, there were points when I was playing that I was having fun with this game. Because I got to play it with John and break it wide open with silent sniper rifles. Like, that was... Oh, we were wrecking with those. Uh, now, I will not sit here and tell you that the whole game was fun, but it did have its moments and its share of dumb costumes and, you know, just little stuff, little stuff to make it fun. John said he was happy to spend $18 on it, and honestly, it's a great deal on Game Pass, so I will have to leave it up to you, but I personally wouldn't pay more than 10 bucks for it. That being said, this game did not justify the slaughter of Arcane Austin. And I know that they have been bleeding talent for a long time and has more to do with Microsoft as a whole, but it's still tragic all these months later. 
we didn't need to lose Arcane Austin. We didn't need to lose Tango Gameworks. We didn't need to lose so many talented developers. Microsoft has made their line in the sand and has crossed it time and time again. So let Redfall serve as not only an example of what could have been in terms of a great game, but also what could be in terms of the future of any studio that, quote, doesn't meet its publisher's demands, requests, or expectations. Even if they do, say Tango Gameworks, you might still get shut down. So Redfall not only bites because of it being honestly just not that good a game, it bites because it represents the declining state of video games, more specifically video game developers, and what we might be seeing more of in the future. With all that in mind, I encourage you to form your own opinions on the game, and let me know in the comments down below what you think about it. I hope to do a few more of these, again, longer form reviews. I know it's not as long as the Thaumaturge was, but the Thaumaturge had a lot more story-wise and gameplay-wise for me to dig into, and this game was... this game was something. All right. Thank you, ladies, gentlemen, everyone in between and beyond for sticking around. I really appreciate it if you've made it to this point with all my rambling. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.